So this is a classic episode that we had a ball with. It's a it's a story that is older than you might expect. It's the story of super soldiers, of military drugs. You've probably heard accounts of World War II military members from various countries using methamphetamine, which is true. You've also probably heard legends about assassins and legends about Viking berserkers. Well, this is the episode where we dive deep into these stories, separating fiction from fact and finding a few conspiracies on the way. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now, or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. You are you. That makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, we're getting closer and closer to the end of the year, you guys. This is the last month of 2016. Yeah, the holiday tree is up in the office. It looks real pretty. It's a Christmas tree. But it's very considerate. We also have a, a video on the origins of Christmas. If you're wondering, hey, what does? why is there a tree in my house now? Uh, the answers, <laughs> the answers may interest you. Uh, but as we, as we round this out, I, I do want to start, start at the top and say that we had some folks ask us about our Halloween special. We've been doing some longer projects that you'll begin to see more and more of in, in the coming years. And we're not done with, uh, we're not done with the occasional special. Uh, not, not the coming years, the coming year. We were going to, we're going to get them done before the next. Several years. Yeah. Hope, yeah, hope. yeah, 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 yeah. In three years, we will f- complete our first project. Four score and seven years from now. Uh, but today, we are talking about something that may affect some of our listeners uh, in, a, in a personal way. Uh, today, we're talking about the military and drug use, uh, specifically drug use as sanctioned by military forces. So, for instance, not... The illegal use of marijuana or opiates, heroin, etc. in Vietnam, for instance, more like the state-sponsored use of speed by several different militaries during World War II. Using drugs to enhance one's performance is an ancient, ancient, capital letter, ancient practice. And over the centuries, institutions encourage the use of all sorts of drugs, from hashish to alcohol to amphetamines to opium and to hallucinogens in experimental settings. It seems like some of those would just kind of make you sit there slack-jawed and not do much for your, you know, murder, murderous rage. Right, right. Quotient. The or, downers, you mean? The, we're specifically talking mostly about uppers in this episode. Well, that those are the ones that make sense to me. You know, mm-hmm. they they kind of give you that, they enhance that fight or flight mentality and kind of like attune your um, reflexes a little bit. Whereas things like marijuana and, um, you know, downers, it seems to me, would possibly make you more sluggish and not necessarily be much help in combat situations. But I don't know. Let's yeah. explore. Well, it reminds me of the YouTube video series that I was a, a super fan of for about a week, uh, which was the Doing X on Salvia series. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, yeah, Big Money Salvia. Yeah, we we had you and I watched that. I think Matt, you may have introduced me to it. I'm a huge fan of the gentleman that makes the videos. He's got a a, a razor wit. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. To your point, Noel, that reminds me of those video series because the entire point or bit of that uh, that series is that when people do salvia, they're physically useless for a minute. Mm-hmm. There's a, a song by the band Oysterhead, which is a combination of uh, Primus, Fish, and uh, Stuart Copeland, the drummer from the police. It's called Armies on Ecstasy, and it makes me think of this line. It says, the Army's on ecstasy, so they say. I read all about it in USA Today. They stepped up urine testing to make it go away, because it's hard to kill the enemy on old MDMA. <laughs> wow. And uh, that's that's a great quotation. I will 
I will follow that up with a quotation from William Tecumseh Sherman, who said, who is the person we most often attribute with the saying, war is hell. Unfortunately, during wartime, individuals on all sides, every side, will tend to commit crimes and atrocities. This includes stuff like assault, yes, and theft and murder of innocents, and of course drug use to either numb the mind or as an attempt to self-medicate. And what we're exploring today is a long-established, often unacknowledged pattern in military history. We, Matt, Noel, and I, are not in any way condoning the use of performance-enhancing drugs or the possibilities for addiction inherent in these substances. Drugs do not care whether you are a civilian, a veteran, or currently serving in the armed services of any nation. There is help available in people that you can reach out to if you feel that there is a problem where you feel yourself headed in that direction, and we guarantee you your life is worth it. That's our disclaimer, but uh, instead of just going into the usual facts or statistics today, let's just admit the, the amount of drug use in militaries is insane. This is already where things get crazy. Well, we said this was an ancient practice, but we didn't say how ancient it was. That's because, oddly enough, drug use in past civilizations was not treated the way it is in the modern day. It was not condemned and vilified. And it was prohibited. like par for the course, more or less. Sure, and and various different drugs were treated in in this way. Um, part of that's likely because modern science has kind of showed us what the dangerous effects of drugs can be. If, like, you take too many, too much of a drug, or if you take drugs in combination with one another, or if you have certain other health risks and then you take a drug. Whereas in olden times, it was more like, ooh, I chewed this leaf and now I can see around corners. Well, yeah, and it could also be treated as medicine, and it was often in the past. Here's this mushroom that taught me about religion. Or consciousness. Right. Uh, so the, that, that's a really good point because First, not all drugs are created equally. Not all of these external substances applied to the human body have the same effects, nor they have the same um, dangers, right? Dangers or short-term benefits. But we do know it goes way, 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 way back. And of course, as you know, the further back in time we go, the more difficult it is to discern, parse, and ultimately decipher the uh, the evidence that we find, right? We do know, though, that the earliest records of drug use in general go back millennia. So in 5000 BCE, we have record that the Sumerians used opium. And this is strongly indicated by the fact that they had an ideogram for it, which translated to something meaning joy or rejoicing. Hmm. Yeah, I think for the Sumerians, it was for people who could afford it, a, a social wide thing. So it's, it was almost like, uh, not, it wasn't just a military use and it may have been sort of an off time or off, uh, off mission thing for militaries if they used it. We're just amazed that they had opium at that time. Cause I think, I know the three of us have talked about it off air. I don't know if we ever talked about it on air, but, I've always been just flabbergasted and in a way impressed or at least fascinated by the mechanisms uh, that humanity has discovered to do drugs. Like I would understand, you know, I understand eating a, a leaf like to your earlier example, Noel, and going, whoa, this knocked me on my keister. But the idea of someone saying like, hold on a second, you know, those uh, those things growing out outside, I'm going to cut them. Not, 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 to not, not like chop them up. I'm going to cut them and let them bleed this sort of latexy substance for a little while. And they're like, oh, why? And they're like, hold on, I'm not done. Then I'm going to scrape it off of the thing. And then I'm going to like through, uh, through a process of dry distillation and concentration. Oh, and I'm also going to invent a syringe. And they're like, wait, what's that? And they're like, no, hold on, hold on. Let me keep going. It's like, and then. I'm going to take a spoon and they're like, oh, yeah, I've heard of spoons. And they're like, yeah, one of those. And I'm going to heat it up, heat up this substance I made. And then I'm going to put it in the syringe. And they're like, again, with the syringes, what are you talking? He's like, look, I'm not done yet. I'm going to put it in my veins. 
that's a lot of work to figure that out. It seems like the same kind of process you would go through for any scientific discovery where it's sort of piggybacking where like maybe one person ate the poppy and mm-hmm. then they realized that it had a quality, but they thought maybe I can get more out of it. Somebody down the line was like, maybe I can get more. There's yeah. a more perfect way to extract whatever it is about this that makes me feel the way I feel. And mm-hmm. then over the years, I mean, I'm sure that process certainly didn't pop up overnight, you know? <laughs> well, you, know, you know the first person that ever sniffed a drug, that was accidental, right? There was some kind of dust in the air, and they just went, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> I mean, nobody did, nobody did that on purpose. And like, no way. That's a good point. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. But it's like, you know, the same way you accidentally figure out how to make fire or something like that, and then you figure out the best method of delivery over time, yeah. and you try to gradually make the process more refined. Yes. Yep. Ju- just like a uh, DNA, it's, it's a glorious string of accidents that occurred and then got refined. And I'm sure a lot of people died along the way. Uh, editorial note for everybody. We're using heroin as an example, uh, injectable heroin, but injectable heroin was not, uh, invented until 1874. So these folks were doing just some form of opium. Uh, and, and weirdly enough, this predates, uh, the earliest historical record of alcohol, which comes from Egypt. That comes from 3500 BC. It's uh, from, yeah, Egyptian papyrus shows that there is a brewery. That's kind of cool. Yeah, and it's all, it's essentially fermentation, right? Mm-hmm. So, so we have to wonder, yeah, maybe opium at that point was an easier drug to consume or an easier substance to consume. We also know that use of hallucinogens or magic mushrooms in particular is thought to date back thousands of years. This relates to another theory, which uh, we know a lot of you love out there, folks. Uh, it's the idea that civilization itself or numerous religions were founded or discovered uh, during these ritualized drug trips. The idea that the deities people worship or the origin of what we call consciousness, to Matt's point, comes from the uh, intense introspection brought on by hallucinogenics. Yeah, the stoned ape theory, I think, is what they call that. There's, well, We won't go into it now. But there were some, I remember reading that some people thought Jesus was actually a magic mushroom. It was all an allegory for magic mushrooms. Right, yeah, that people were communicating in these sort of anthropomorphic uh, symbolic terms. And speaking of chewing leaves, um, evidence shows that people have been chewing and eating the leaves of a plant called the beetle since at least 2660 BC. Um, this particular plant contains chemicals that are, uh, have stimulant effects and uh, euphoria inducing properties, sort of like maybe a coca leaf. Uh, and these days are mostly consumed in Asia. And this brings us to the allegations of drug use in ancient fighting forces, which is, uh, which is a fascinating topic and a lot of it is difficult to prove. So we're entering the area of professional academics arguing with each other back and forth against conferences. You have been warned. Uh, (laughs) do you guys, uh, each want to do one? Sure. Yeah. Can I start? Yeah. Please do. So many of you out there have probably heard of berserkers maybe from a video game like myself, or from reading uh, historical documentation. Or from that song in Clerks, the movie. Berserker! Oh, wow. Do, 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 berserker! So historical berserkers were infamous Viking warriors, and there were these fearsome guys who would dress in skins of animals like bears and according to uh, history, they would attack friend or foe with this insane ferocity and tenacity, uh, just like they're going to go at anything that's near them that they can perceive as possibly a threat. If anyone's been watching Westworld, there's a great example of a berserker, I think, in two episodes, two or three episodes from the last one, um, a guy in a huge, huge hulking guy with like a like a mask on with horns and mm-hmm. like wielding this giant, absurd club that mm-hmm. only like a superhuman mutant could wield uh, or, you know, a uh, Viking on drugs or a host. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one of the uh, one of the more popular theories about these berserkers, uh, well, the strength 
and the frenzy that they could muster was that they're under the influence of some kind of substance, some kind of drug. Uh, although experts who believe this theory, they aren't conclusively sure what sort of drug this would have been. Right. My mind goes to PCP, but I'm fairly certain that that's not what they were on. Um, who knows what they could have been ingesting if they were in fact doing so. They've been, yeah, the, the guesses range from, uh, hallucinogenic mushroom, Amanita muscaria, or massive amounts of alcohol. Whoa. Uh, what's interesting there is that some of that would fit in with practical usage or ritual usage, excuse me. But when we think of hallucinogenic trips or, or the behavior that sort of stuff induces, it creates a trance-like state, but not typically a violent one. Mm -hmm. Also, there have been accounts that people would fall into these states when they were doing non-warlike behavior. So just fixing uh, doing some blacksmithing work, right? Fixing a ship, yeah. Yeah, fixing a ship, carving. Fixing sure. a ship's a great example. And one of the other explanations was that maybe there was self-induced hysteria or epilepsy or mental illness, Ooh. which is disturbing and fascinating its implications, but by far the most popular theory is that there was some sort of uh, drug involved. Maybe a combination. Maybe a combination, for sure. Uh, and then we have another example of fighting force, the infamous Assassins. Ooh, more video game stuff. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that movie looks good. Assassin's Creed movie. I don't even want to talk about it. Why? It, <laughs> it seems it, like the stuff of movies. Why, why is it... it why, why? Yes, it is the stuff of movies. It and I mean, it's not like we've had a single good video game to movie adaptation, so I think we're due one. Well, there was Tron. There was also Pac-Man the movie. I'm kidding, that's not real. There was, uh, there was Battleship, which is based on a board game. Uh, <laughs> ever, that, ever since Uwe Boll, uh, my, my heart has just Uwe? been broken. Uwe? Oh, old Uwe? Uwe? Yeah, no, Uwe Boll. He's my boy. But yeah, Assassins. Um, Marco Polo. Uh, is the originator of many of the reports of assassins from his travels in the uh, the, the Orient. Can we say Orient? Is that okay to say? I I think don't in this know. stage, yeah. All right, cool. Um, so yeah, he talks of he tells a tale of the old man of the mountain or Sabah who would drug his young followers, sort of like a almost like a Shaolin like monk fighting instructor. Um, he would drug them with hashish, lead them to paradise, and then claim that only he had the means to allow for their return. So perceiving that Sabah was either a prophet or some sort of demon magician, his disciples, believing that only he could return them to paradise, were completely committed to his cause, would do whatever it took to get that feeling again, and were willing to carry out his every wish. Uh, and this is mentioned in Baudolino, which is a fiction, but, yeah. uh, you know, with some historical um, truths peppered in there. Yeah, Baudolino is uh, by a, an author named Umberto Eco, and it's about this guy who's just an absolute dirtbag, but he uh, rises to fame and, and it examines some of the, oh, the way that a grain of truth would give, um, would, give rise to an entire world of rumors and lies, but that one of the things they do mention in that book is the um the paradise of the assassins, where there wherein there's a character who says, you know, I saw these guys saying they went to paradise, but what they were doing was just sort of standing there in chains, doped up. Mm. Uh so it's interesting the idea of compelling people to fight through what may have been some sort of Psycholo psychological manipulation, obviously, but... It sounds to me like it would have been more like something stronger, like opium. Right. I mean, there would have to be some kind of dependency for them to have been so worried about getting back to that state that they would kill, you know, and follow mm -hmm. blindly. Well, hashish doesn't seem like it would have as, as, as much of a hold, but that's just, you know... Yeah, it's like that joke in Half-Baked when that guy goes to rehab for marijuana. Maybe, what, maybe it was a crazy strain, you guys. Perhaps. Well... We, we know that, okay, so the origins of the assassins can be traced back to like 1080 or so, uh, 1080 common era. Um, 
and most of most of the early sources of this movement unfortunately were written by people who were enemies oh. of the order based on stuff sort of like the templars had a lot of stuff written by their enemies uh and a lot of the stuff that dealt with the order's inner workings were destroyed uh in 1256 but like Noel said uh we we know that the originator of the cult uh and the I guess the progenitor, the patriarch of the movement was uh, the Grand Master Hassan E. Saba. We also know that Mesoamerican cultures have a long and storied history of seeking enlightenment and enhanced performance through the ingestion of drugs. However, and perhaps surprising for some people, most documented use was either completely ritual or spiritual stuff or medicinal. In that climate, there was just a preponderance of differing drugs that people could use. And this this use of drugs, despite uh, changing cultural opinions, like we live in a pretty prohibitive society now, mm-hmm. uh, partially, to, partially because of health concerns, but I would also argue more so to control the flow of uh, money and to control the status quo or hierarchical system that's been set up here. Some people might disagree. Uh, I'm fine with that because it is just my opinion. If you, if you feel that, uh, if you feel that prohibition, despite the overwhelming evidence that it in no way works to the benefit of the public, I mean, like, if you choose to believe that despite the evidence, that's your opinion and you're welcome to it. Pardon my rant. Uh, the, the drug, u- the connection between drug use and militaries, though, has continued, albeit, Widely unacknowledged in our current era, it was widely understood in uh, in past eras, right? In recent centuries. I mean, there's that time that uh, Britain got drunk and took over the world. I love that. Well, I'm sorry. I'm being flippant, but, you know, <laughs> I mean, they were drunk already. They just also took over the world. Yes, there is a noted um, historical industrial level advocacy of alcohol by the British Empire. One example comes from the Napoleonic Wars. During these wars, alcohol use was encouraged among British troops as a way to guard against disease, allegedly, and to boost morale. I mean, I can imagine it doing that, right? Just pour a little alcohol on it. It'll kill all the germs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, sure. Um, Because we we do know alcohol was used as almost a painkiller. At the time when For there sure. was some kind of issue going on in the battlefield, or you needed to be stitched up. Well, and not to mention, you think of like the officers' class in their, you know, clubs. Their their kind of private clubs with their brandy and their cigars, with their epaulets and all of their medals and stuff. It's just part of the culture, um, you know, both on and off the battlefield. It well, seems. Sure. Well, speaking of that, some soldiers were known to spend a month's worth of wages on alcohol in one sitting, like uh, just go and go all out. And Drink your whole paycheck in one night at the bar. Well, yeah, because you got to go. You might as well go large. That's go right. large and go hard. And you got to buy a round for the whole pub. Also, teetotalers were reviled, known as, <clears throat> I take offense to this, by the way, Methodists. Why do you take offense to this? Because I was a Methodist growing yeah, up. Me too. And I was also a teetotaler. Right, but you're you're drinking now. I'm drinking at this moment, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we each have a yard of ale in front of us. It's right true. Now. It's true. And it's funny that you mentioned the idea of officers clubs because there was a hierarchy there. Yes. Officers had standing orders to avoid any drunken privates, the lower ranking members of the military, uh, because they often attacked their superiors. Well, you know, uh, if you're drunk and you're upset with your higher up because he made you do some things you didn't want to do. Got a head full of steam. I can imagine that leading to some bad situations. Well, let's also consider it was not, they didn't have the same code of military behavior that exists today. Weren't these also in the days of like being Press put games. in front of a firing squad for insubordination? Yeah, 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 for treason. Yeah, or getting branded. Yeah. Speaking of which, have you guys seen the film Paths of Glory? I have not seen it. came up in a conversation with my, my friend the other night. Um, there, I only mention it because it, it does kind of show some of this, uh, drinking culture in the British Army. Um, but it's a fantastic movie. It's an early Kubrick movie and it sort of deals with 
it deals with questions of morality when taking orders. Mm. And it's, it's fabulous. Very, very ahead of its time. Like, honestly, it's almost a precursor to Dr. Strangelove in, in that it's sort of lampoons sort of the military system and the way people blindly take orders. And then there's one character who kind of is a little different, but it shows that hierarchy of the officer's class and it shows that on the ground drunkenness kind of vibe as well. So I think it's an interesting film for the sort of like a, Downton Abbey upstairs, downstairs. It is okay. like that, but it's much more tongue in cheek and it's very, it's very sardonic. It's an excellent, excellent film. We should check that shot. out. You guys, but I think before we continue with all of this debauchery talk, we should have a quick pause for the cause that is the advertisements what keep our lights on. <laughs> So we talked a little bit about the use of military, uh, military sponsored drug programs, but we would be remiss if we didn't mention the wars over drugs. Uh, one of the first that historians typically point to be the series of conflicts known as the Opium Wars. We talked a little bit about this in our podcast on The Great Game, which you can check out at our website, StuffTheyDon'tWantYouToKnow.com. However, quick and dirty version, uh, China had many resources that the British Empire wanted. China? <laughs> For mm-hmm. one, yes, absolutely. However, uh, the British Empire did not have very many resources that China wanted. They did control opium production. So they became, as an empire, this huge drug pusher. And China said, stop pushing opium on our people. It's doing terrible things. And then they fought a series of wars for that uh, because it was ultimately as every single war – has eventually been, it's over resources, and they might disguise it as ideology to sucker other people. Uh, yes. And if you're, uh, if you're interested in the opium wars, check out our videos that we did on that topic. There are a couple rather extensive ones. I think one is almost eight minutes long, and it goes uh-huh. through all the history of it. Uh, we also notice, right, and you notice this too, that cocaine has been used as an income stream for various militias, and militaries, including facets of the U.S. military. Uh, shout out to Oliver North. And the Nicaraguan Contras. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and FARC. Uh, so morphine was also used in the U.S. Civil War. It was the standout drug star of that. It was used as a painkiller, and get this, to stave off diarrhea. Yeah, because diarrhea was extremely dangerous at that time. And you- apparently opi- opiates give... Make, make people constipated when they use it pretty regularly. Well, there you go. So it so it worked in that regard. People just probably weren't as aware of the side effects or the highly addictive nature. Mm-hmm. So hundreds of thousands of people returned from the war with uh, with an addiction. Well, it's funny. It's, it's like we were talking about earlier where you kind of like – you sort of plunge headlong into these things because they have an immediate effect, whether you're, you know, early man chewing that leaf and getting a burst of energy, even as, as, as recently as the Civil War, you, you have a drug that allows people to return to battle, you know, return to the battlefield. You're going to use it and you're not really going to think about the consequences. And mm. that is a whole nother problem that then springs up later that you have to then deal with. You've kind of created an epidemic. With that and point. hopefully, yeah, hopefully learn from the past. Which brings us to the story of the uh, the bell of the ball when it comes to uh, military sponsored drug use, and that's speed, ice, methamphetamine, uh, the Heisenberg blue. I'm just making words up now at this point. Uh, Noel, could could you break down a little bit of the invention of amphetamine for us? So amphetamine was first synthesized in 1887 in Germany by a Romanian chemist by the name of Lazar Edelinu, um, who named it, let me see if I can get this right, phenyl isopropylamine. Um, and then in 1893, 
a Japanese chemist named Nagai Nagayoshi synthesized methamphetamine from ephedrine, which is still, I think, one of the main precursors used today to make mm-hmm. methamphetamine. Mm-hmm. Which is why uh, people used to buy those people used to buy those over the counter pills that contained ephedrine and use it to create uh, methamphetamine. And now if anyone you know watch who watches Breaking Bad knows this, uh, or anyone who's tried to buy some cold medicine, you sometimes have to sign a registry uh, and and at the very least you've got to get it from over the counter. Yep. I mean wow. from behind the counter rather. Yeah. You can't just buy it and off the rack. Yeah, because apparently people were driving around and buying uh, at first there were no limits on how much one person could buy, and then in some states, people were driving around and buying it at multiple, you know, gas stations and pharmacies. And yeah, stuff. they call them Smurfs in uh, in Breaking Bad. The people that go around and get the uh, the pseudo ephedrine. Wow, that's their job is to like go to go all over as far as they have to go to get the right amount to make the uh, the, the the batch that's needed. I totally forgot about that. They call them Smurfs. What is this show you guys keep talking about? You know, break. You didn't see Breaking Bad. Breaking. It's like a. Uh, you liked Friends, right? Yes. It's like Friends. But with okay. meth. But with... Whoa. Yeah. Meth Friends. Meth Friends. The best friends. <laughs> uh, in 1934, uh, a company named Smith, Klein, and French began selling amphetamine as an inhaler under the trade name Benzedrine and was designed as a decongestant. Whoa. Well, it, it, and it, it took off. Uh, again, we we have to remember I, it's one of the points we made earlier that the people who are peddling these aren't necessarily bad people in any way they're just perhaps not as aware of the possibilities of what could happen uh and there's lots of profit to be made and there's a definite profit motive there Inarguable evidence indicates that both the Axis and the Allied powers used speed on a routine basis during World War II. Yeah, there's a substance that was used under the brand name, it sounds a little strange, Pervitin? Pervitin, yeah, P-E-R-V-I-T-I-N. Initially, this was intended only to be dispensed to military drivers on the front lines with Poland. Uh, on the German side. Correct. Um, guess what? What? That didn't last. Between April and July of 1940, more than 35 million tablets of pervitine and isofan, this was a slightly modified version that was produced by another company, they were shipped to the German Army and Air Force. So that's a lot of them. Wow. And uh, just really fast before we move on, I'm just thinking about drivers using some kind of upper in that way. Mm -hmm. And it just reminds me of... Tales I have heard from truck drivers who have to go cross country in a fairly short amount of time or at least as fast as possible. Right. You have to stay awake when you're driving 12, 14, 16 hours. Right. We know that we, we know that in many civilian occupations where there's a, a large amount of time that requires some sustained focus Mm -hmm. uh uppers of one sort or another are common you can go to a truck stop across america's interstates and find various things purporting to be legal speed Mm -hmm. Uh, the difference here is that this was a military condoning it enforcing it in private partnership, the people in charge of Pervertine were making so much money hand over fist. And one of the heartbreaking things about this is that you can read letters from the front lines to, you know, like these are younger soldiers mm-hmm. writing to their parents saying, I'm OK, you know, war is hell, but here I am. Hey, also, could you send me some more of this stuff or some money to buy it? We also know from 1942 to 1945, Hitler himself was given meth injections. This is a fact that many historians have argued contributed somewhat to his increasingly erratic behavior over time. Uh, It's also known that he used cocaine and heroin, so he was bouncing all over the place with different drugs. Yeah, his personal doctor has uh, has written proof of something like 800 plus injections he gave the he gave the guy i'm referring to adolf hitler as the guy yeah. uh he also we also know that there was extensive drug use in many of the uh many of the upper 
spheres of the Reich organization. Uh, you can read a lot about this in a book called Blitzed, which we'll Whoa. mention later in further reading. Yeah, but it, it shows an inside look at just how extensive drug use was uh, amongst the Reich. And, and also, in this regard, we have to point out that uh, the at least one of the Allied forces, Winston Churchill, was off his gourd yeah. for most, uh, most if not all, of the war. He was stinking drunk for a lot of important moments in world history. He, you know, people like I'm not saying he did a bad job, but it is ignoring the truth if we ignore that that is also a form of drug abuse. Sure. Right? Uh, so. Finland, for the record, also used this uh, stimulant, but as far as we know, it was only issued to elite long-range commandos. Oh, wow. Japan was also extensively involved in the use of methamphetamines. It was sold under the registered trademark of Philopon by a company called Dainipon Pharmaceuticals, uh, and they exist today, by the way, under a different name. An estimated 1 billion Philippon fills were produced between 1939 and 1945. Japan, unlike uh, other countries, supplied this substance not just to their military, but also to industrial workers. So Whoa. imagine being at a factory and say, hey, you've got eight hours. Do you want to do twice the amount of work? Jeez. Just keep going, man. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Here's one you may have heard of. Amphetamine was also given to Allied bomber pilots during WW2. Uh, the Laurier Military History Archives in Ontario, Canada contain records that suggest soldiers um, should, were recommended, they ingest 5 milligrams to 20 milligrams of benzedrine sulfate every 5 to 6 hours. And it is estimated that 72 million amphetamine tablets were consumed by the Allies during World War II. That is a mountain of, of speed. All in one night. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, no. And then paratroopers also were allegedly using uh, amphetamines during the D-Day landings while U.S. Marines relied on it for the invasion of Tarawa in 1943. Oh, and if it continues today. Actually, I wanted to recommend um, Stuff to Blow Your Mind, our sister podcast, recently did an episode called Combat Stims. Um, a lot of it had to do with some science fiction use of drugs and video games like uh, Fallout, the Fallout universe, mm-hmm. where you have like Jet and Psycho and a lot of these uh, mm-hmm. kind of fictional drugs that are based on real things. But Starcraft. Um, they got a letter from a listener that um, – who who was who served recently uh overseas and he said it was a very common knowledge that there was plenty of sanctioned use of Adderall um which is a form of of methamphetamine it's not really methamphetamine but it's an analog i would say it has very similar effects um mm. and things just like nicotine for example is just very much par for the course um so i recommend you guys check out that episode if you want to catch a little supplement for some of this stuff right and we this brings us to the present uh, here's the name, one of the common names for the modern day speed used by the U.S. Army. They're called Go Pills. The U.S. Air Force has pilots, of course, and those pilots use amphetamines, and it's one of the most widely documented examples of the use of performance enhancing drugs by military personnel, period. These uh, these individuals are often tasked with excessively long missions. Some of them might last upwards of 20 hours. And DOD scientists began to issue what are called dextroamphetamines, more commonly known as speed, but referred to as go pills in the Air Force, to the pilots to ensure they're alert long enough uh, after tiredness and fatigue would have started driving their mental performance down. It's like the old thing. Uh, did you guys ever do this when you were a kid to see, uh, did you ever see how long you could stay awake? Oh, sure. I how, do that still. How long did you make it? All night. So 24 hours? I remember staying oh, up yeah. all night a handful of times where I really, really tried and felt good about it. Like I kind of cheated death in some way. Yeah. yeah. My, my longest I think is around 37 hours, but then at that point there was nothing I could do. We right after the, a certain point, you begin to hallucinate. Yes. You lose dexterity, and I would say you lose your mental agility as well. It was during the 48-hour film fest uh, when I was in college. That's when it happened. <laughs> I tried to make it the 48, but I could mm-hmm. not. Now, the what's interesting here is that the 
the Air Force admits prescribing what they call small doses of these and similar substances to pilots on long-range missions. Surveys show that roughly half of American fighter pilots took amphetamines during Desert Storm. Some commanders were so alarmed by the what they saw as a growing addiction to the pills that they ordered their subordinates uh, not to use them. And this, this stuff is commonly known by its brand name Dexedrine. In civilian use, it's primarily meant to treat hyperactivity in children and narcolepsy. Narcolepsy, of course, being the, uh, being the disorder in which patients fall asleep suddenly and without warning. The drugs produced by GlaxoSmithKline, which is based in the United Kingdom. Does and that, that na- sound familiar? Name might sound a little bit familiar, uh, because GlaxoSmithKline is descended from the earlier company, Smith Klein and French that we began uh, that we mentioned in 1934, and the U.S. has a a unique history with a lot of with a lot of these drugs just because so many wars drive innovation or drive that cycle of trial and error into a uh, a, a, a at a much faster clip, right? Mm-hmm. So things that would have taken. Ten years to figure out, take one. Things that would have taken a hundred years to figure out, take ten, because the you know the clock is ticking, and we're seeing entire nations and cultures pour all of their energy into something. According to an author named David Grossman, Vietnam was the first war in which the forces of modern pharmacology were directed to empower the battlefield soldier. Mm. So, for the first time, we talked about. Speed being prescribed or or mandated in World War II, but for the first time in military history in Vietnam, that's the first time we see potent antipsychotic drugs being prescribed. And these are things that are also manufactured by GlaxoSmithKline, such as Thorazine. The massive use of drugs in Vietnam led to crippling uh crippling PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and addiction among veterans. And a lot of this, unfortunately, there's another conspiracy here, a lot of it was swept under the rug of, by the U.S. government. And when we say, like, addiction and an epidemic, to use Noel's earlier term, there were veterans that were dying of uh, withdrawal-associated symptoms on the plane ride back from Vietnam, so imagine you're you're hardcore addicted to a substance. You're on the plane for what a thirteen fourteen hour flight. Hmm. It doesn't it doesn't look good, you know. Uh, the, it's going to be at best a very unpleasant experience. Thinking about these antipsychotic drugs, I'm imagining everything that we've learned over time about how certain drugs that are meant to treat that kind of thing or or are antipsychotic can actually enhance. Effects of uh, feeling depressed or um, can exhibit violent behaviors and that kind of thing. And I'm just imagining in the context of the Vietnam War if those drugs actually had any effect. And I'm, I'm going to look more into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, we know that it did promote a, a huge, huge jump in usage of these drugs. They were freely available. You know, this is near... This is near one of the epicenters of heroin and opium production mm-hmm. where this war occurs. And, of course, use of methamphetamine is also present there. But these uses of drugs were not restricted to wartime events or front-of-line uh, front phenomena. We also know that Various militaries, various governments have an extensive and unfortunate history of conducting experiments on uh, civilians and on soldiers. And we will get into that immediately after another quick break. So for two decades during the Cold War, the U.S. Army tested chemical weapons on American soldiers at a place called Edgewood Arsenal, which was a secluded research facility on the Chesapeake Bay, where thousands of men were recruited to volunteer um, and were exposed to chemicals ranging from mustard gas, sarin gas, LSD, PCP, uh, just a 
boatload of psychotropic and pharmaceutical substances. So at the center of all this was a man named Colonel James Ketchum, who was conducting the experiments, uh, specifically one with a drug called BZ. Um, the Arsenal's chief scientist, Dr. Van Murray Sim, instigated a, a whole battery of overseas practical experiments. <laughs> Uh, in which LSD was tested in enhanced interrogations. I should probably that as well uh, on um, poor, unhelpless, unwitting subjects. Yeah. And just to note, BZ might be unfamiliar to uh, some of us. It was unfamiliar to us when we were first looking into this. Its real name is 3 quinoclidinyl benzylate. Uh, it is a... It was called Substance 78 by the Soviet Army, which is probably my favorite name there. Uh, it is a compound related to atropine, scopolamine, or uh, a couple other deliriants. And the effects that it have are uh, in- inducing stupor, confusion, illusions, hallucination, uh, and just absolute madness. It's it's not a thing to put in somebody's coffee and a surprise. Hey! <laughs> yeah, that's a bad idea. Which we're actually going to get to something kind of like that very soon after we talk about Captagon, which is a, I guess, it's, pre- it's like speed. Mm-hmm. It, it's pretty much a speed. Um, and we've seen its use in, especially in Syria. This comes from Al Jazeera from a recent article from 2016 in November. Middle Eastern conflicts have seen an increase in the rise of Captagon, an amphetamine that's allegedly fueling Syria's civil war. Last November in 2015, 11 million pills were seized by Turkish officials at the Syrian-Turkish border. While this April, 1.5 million were seized in Kuwait. And there's this BBC documentary called Syria's War Drug, that was in September of 2015, and if if you watch that, I would say if you can find it, you should watch it. But there's one user of this drug who is saying, quote, There was no fear anymore when I took Captagon. You can't sleep or close your eyes. Forget about it. So this is a drug that would just keep you going no matter what. At all times, you're going to be aware, or at least somewhat aware of your surroundings. Did either of you watch Jessica Jones? Yes. Remember the, the character who was on some sort of experimental drug? Yeah, he's that, ba- based on Nuke from the comic book. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. But like, it seems like this was in that vein where it sort of caused him to just go almost as though he were like a sleeper agent to all of a sudden go into just berserker mode where he had no fear and felt no pain and only wanted to kill. Mm. And people say that there's a... Um, I guess the best way to say it is that this popped up in the news recently, and by recently, I mean a few years ago, where there were, you would read stories of, you know, like, uh, Middle Eastern officials, private plane, detained with thousands of Captagon pills. And Captagon is a brand name for phenethylene. And this, uh, the way Captagon works, uh, is that it's a combination. Accord, this is according to Nicholas Rasmussen, who's a professor of history and philosophy of science at uh, New South Wales in Australia. He said Captagon is really a combination of two drugs, theophylline and amphetamine. And he said the combination is inactive in the body, but when the body breaks down into the two components, each part becomes active. So Captagon is relatively mild in the world of amphetamines and – Some people, including professor of psychology and psychiatry Carl Hart at Columbia University, went so far as to call it an inferior amphetamine. So they say uh, that like Adderall, Captagon was once used to uh, treat behavioral problems. But it is definitely seen as a performance-enhancing drug. Uh, people also say abuse of it has been a problem in Saudi Arabia for over a decade. It's, it's big in the Middle East. And we know that this use is, is probably going to continue if people own the means to manufacture it. And it's seen as providing uh, someone an edge when they're when they're fighting in battle, then why wouldn't they continue using it? I, I don't see why. And we have another, of course, we have a, 
which we call this the honorable mention or human experimentation emeritus as far as drugs go. I like it. You're talking about Ultra, MK Ultra, and uh, all the other experiments that went on around that time, all the operations. Mm. What were the other ones? Artichoke. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the list of them, but there's there's a whole host of uh, Mockingbird, I think was one, mm. Mm. of CIA operations that were dealing with testing out drugs and what we can do with these from an intelligence perspective. Right, to see if they could if they could create Manchurian candidates or sleeper agents uh, or if they could create a truth serum yeah, for interrogations if they could mess with people's memories and it is as we know disturbingly possible to manipulate a person's memories yeah. Uh, well, especially because they're using a whole host of drugs. They were testing yeah. pretty much everything. One of the things they did that I thought was really disturbing was uh, forced morphine addiction and then forced withdrawal. Jeez. So to see the effect it would have on uh, someone who was a, a POW or something, they would forcibly addict a uh, subject to morphine and then they would forcibly – uh, you know, once they got them to the addiction stage, they would forcibly not give them any. And I believe that I believe that morphine is one of those drugs where the withdrawal symptoms alone can actually take your life. Is Jeez. that correct? I don't know. I mean, it's my understanding that very, very intense opium, opiate rather, withdrawals can cause you to, you know, experience cardiac arrest or you can you know have trouble breathing and things like wow. that. Wow. And this this also involved, you know, tricking people into having bad trips. LSD famously. Right. And famously that's one of the only documented MK Ultra deaths allegedly. Again, the only documented one is someone who while on LSD jumped through a window to their death. Mm -hmm. And we still haven't done a full episode on this, have we? On MK Ultra? Have we not? I feel like we haven't. I don't know. We're, if we have not, we are going to. Okay. It just M MK Ultra seems to cast its shadow over so much stuff whenever ever we get into this sort of water, this murky water. It feels like MK Ultra has just always sort of been here with us. Yeah, and, and it's real. It's real, by the way. If anyone ever tells you that the experimentation done by the CIA with these drugs is not real, uh, you can send them some, to some documentation that shows that it is, uh, inclu including artichoke and some FOIA documents that were released. That stands for Freedom of Information Act. Now, we cast our gaze to the future. So it surprises some people who have not had a relative in the military or themselves been an active, uh, been an active member of the military. It's, it can be surprising to learn that, uh, the use of drugs that would get people arrested on the streets of the country you're, they're defending, uh, are par for the course when they're out there on the front lines. But this isn't just a past to the present thing. This is not a plateauing phenomenon. Instead, if anything, it's kicking into overdrive. Thanks to research by various think tanks across the world. In the U.S., of course, we have the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, better known as DARPA. And DARPA is pushing us closer and closer toward the creation of a genuine super soldier. Yeah, in 2004, the Peak Soldier Performance Program looked for a, quote, biochemical approach that would allow a soldier to operate in theater for up to five days without requiring sustenance. In pursuit of this, no stone or genome was left unturned. Yeah, and that's a that's a statement from some of the folks who were liaising with the Pentagon and with DARPA. There there has been extensive research into a life without sleep. We know that nature approaches sleep in, in many different ways. You know, uh, predators tend to sleep more than prey. Uh, certain animals are only awake at certain times of day or most active at certain times of day or night. Uh, we know that some marine mammals sleep in a very different way in comparison to terrestrial mammals. So 
DARPA and various projects sponsored by or spearheaded or assisted by DARPA have dug into both of these things. Is there a way to create a human process to turn off part of the brain to sleep the way that a dolphin would sleep, for instance, or a cephalopod? Or is there a way to take an anti-narcolepsy drug like uh, modafinil and turn it into a, a pill you take that makes you never have to sleep again without racking up sleep debt? You can read a pretty interesting article on the fight against sleep over at our parent website, HowStuffWorks.com. And this this search continues today because at this point um, – we, we see two concurrent branches of research. One is how do we make someone who doesn't need to sleep? And the other one is how do we make something that doesn't need to sleep? So like a drone mm-hmm. or an automated robot. Uh, at different times, Matt and Noel and I have hung out and just watched, pick, uh, watched video clips of DARPA robots, which are stranger and stranger and stranger. I like the ones where they slip on banana peels. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, you know, there's one that really disturbed me, which I don't think was DARPA, but it was a robot that was, you know, exhibiting walking and negotiating obstacles. And the entire video was just this human who was, like, pushing them down and throwing yeah. stuff at them. That was a Boston Dynamics robot, which is now owned by Alphabet. Oh, man, the parent company of Google, huh? Yes, sir. Alphabet. Uh, well, uh, DARPA has also done research on a pain vaccine. Uh, this comes from a popular mechanic story. The idea is that when injected with the vaccine, let's say, let's say I'm a soldier on the front line, I get shot in the gut. You know, that's an ugly, dirty way to go, right? Um, unless I get immediate medical attention. Uh, so they inject me with a vaccine because the, there's so much pain. The immediate agony not only disappears, but apparently for a month that I would not feel pain. For Whoa. 30 days, there would be like it wouldn't register. Now, you would still have the instinctual reactions of painful situations. Like if all three of us had that vaccine now and we touched a stove that mm-hmm. was on, our hands would immediately recoil away. We just wouldn't feel burned. Whoa. Scary well, What stuff. would you feel, though? Obviously, though, there's you still would have the uh, issues associated with being badly burned. Right. You know, you could get an infection. Mm-hmm. You know, there's any number of things that could happen. So, I mean, this isn't always, you know, not – pain is ultimately a uh, a resource for us to allow us to know that, that we are messed up and we need to seek medical attention. Yeah, it's so an indicator. If, if you lack that, uh, you could certainly – be nursing a wound that you wouldn't know much about and not get it looked at and uh, possibly get sepsis or something and die. Yeah, exactly. That's that's one of the dangerous parts because this is meant to prolong fighting ability, uh, which means that, yeah, somebody horrifically burned would keep fighting, but their body wouldn't enter shock to save them. So they would just eventually die without feeling bad. Jeez. That's, I mean, that's the potential. It's not there yet, but that's the potential. Or we don't know if it's there yet because the only things that we hear about are the unclassified research. Another thing is, you know how uh, bears hibernate, different animals hibernate. Mm-hmm. What if people could do that? What if, uh, what if if someone's wounded has a, an egregious wound? Uh, what if the doctors could just chemically induce hibernation and? Like suspended animation of sorts? Mm-hmm. Hypersleep. Whoa. Like an alien. Yeah. And then just bring them back. Uh, bring, them, bring them back when they're in a, uh operating theater and, you know, conduct the surgery to save their life. The idea here is almost the opposite to keep them fighting. It's put them on ice yeah. uh, through the use of hydrogen sulfide and, and blood removal what? To extend the golden period after an injury. So like stopping their heart from beating, but somehow they're still alive so that their wound doesn't continue to bleed out. Is that the idea, I guess? Well, now, Matt, I've never actually done it. <laughs> oh, I'm just, sorry. Just <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. Um, it's just, that's, that's incredible. 
and then further future of pharmacology stuff, there would be virtual reality, augmented reality uh, with focus drugs. So there's still speed equivalents, but then there's also technology entering in there like transcranial direct simulation, shocking your brain to make you think better. Yeah, buddy. Uh, we know also that – I know we're picking on the U.S. a lot here. It's just the U.S. – tends to have the best documentation of this in recent years. We know that other institutions and other global militaries are conducting similar experiences. Both Russia and China are believed to be experimenting with performance-enhancing drugs and other techniques, including genetic modification. However, at this point, aside from statements from Pentagon officials, there's very little in the way of substantive proof. So we don't know how much they are or are not doing. And people will, you know, raise some pitchforks and torches over CRISPR, but CRISPR's not there yet. CRISPR has the potential to be the dystopian Gattaca S thing people fear, but it, it hasn't happened yet. And then of course in the corporate world, there's cocaine, alcohol, and Adderall. I got a little something to say about Adderall. There was a study published, um, I want to say it was this year, by Dr. Carl Hart, who's a neuropsychopharmacologist uh, at Columbia University. And his career has mainly been dedicated to studying the effects of drugs um, and drug policy on the public uh, and really focusing on trying to put an end to what's been deemed uh, the war on drugs. Um, and in uh, this study, he basically determined that um, Adderall is very, 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 very similar um, effects-wise to methamphetamine. And anyone you know who's an adult who is prescribed Adderall, if you know anything about the effects of speed, I think it's not too much of a stretch to say that Adderall is definitely a form of speed. And it is still, to this day, prescribed to kids for... Um, you know, ADHD. And I don't know, I, I just think uh, it's an interesting cultural disconnect that we have when we yeah. have this war on drugs where we are, you know, throwing grenades into babies' cribs in the hopes of, you know, catching some meth dealers. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we're feeding, you know, school kids these very powerful prescription uppers, really. That's a great point. And it goes the same way with any psychoactive substance like remember the days when it became popular to prescribe ritalin lithium zoloft and things like that to kids yeah and that has some damaging that's, effects that's still a serious issue not necessarily with those specific drugs but mm -hmm. antipsychotics with children is a big deal currently well i mean not only that i'm not trying to get on a high horse here and, and everyone has their opinions as far as like eastern versus western medicine and and you know whatever it, it takes to get someone well i understand the desire to want to find that thing but i just you know it, it's so easy just by telling a doctor that you're experiencing a little bit of stress you know he'll offer you um Valium, mm -hmm. you know, without you having to twist his arm at all. I mean, it's just depends on the doctor, obviously, but that is definitely part of our culture. And I think a lot of that is tied to our kind of, you know, marriage to the pharma pharmaceutical industry. And I just I think it's not quite the way it should be. It's it's very interesting. And, you know, and, and, and when you look at it through the lens of this conversation about, you know, using drugs um, for military purposes and how this attitude goes, you know, infiltrates up to the highest levels of our government and bureaucracy in the military. I just think it is kind of a systemic problem that mm -hmm. we need to um, address. Yeah. And it's also, it's common throughout demographics, throughout creeds, throughout genders, throughout uh, socioeconomic uh, status in the world of academia, of course, uh, there was a study that found a quarter of undergraduate students. That sounds so high, right? One in four are, are on Adderall or on some other performance enhancing thing. And then a lot of professors or professional instructors apparently are on it as well. And that's not even mentioning nootropics or the so-called smart drugs. 
We're, we're going to have to end it here, I think, uh, in our examination, but we want to end it with some further reading to recommend if you'd like to delve into this. There's an excellent book called Blitzed by Norman Oler, which is about the drug use, the prevalence of drug use, one should say, in uh, the German side of World War II. Uh, another book on killing by David Grossman. That's where uh, you'll find some more information about pharmacology and Vietnam. Uh, and instead of doing a shout out corner today, you guys, what if we do a call for stories for people who've had experience with, uh, with the state sanctioned use of performance enhancing substances? In the military, um, whether you are a U.S. citizen or it's in another military uh, from a different part of the world, we'd like to hear your story. And do not worry, we will not uh, reveal your name or rank or anything like that. If you want to talk to us about something, uh, don't be afraid of that. We we appreciate your privacy. Let us know your story. As Matt said, we will protect your anonymity. Let us also know, and you don't have to... Uh, only be in the military to write us. Let us also know if you have an idea for an upcoming topic, something we should cover in the future. Again, this is your show, and our best ideas come from listeners just like you, specifically you. And that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.